Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Um, today, we're going to be going through a um, presentation on some more advanced uh, weather concepts. It's called basic meteorology concepts, but uh, we're kind of progressing into the ability to make predictions about weather. Um, so at this point, you should have already had a uh, review of synoptic plots. Um, in other words, the weather station models, the little diagrams that can show temperature, pressure, humidity, um, wind speed, wind direction, things like that. And you should have also looked at the um, video on wind belts. Um, that's a very important concept. So <clears throat> today what we're going to be doing is kind of expanding and going into that um, a little bit more, looking at how wind moves um, and start looking at frontal boundaries or areas of different um, air characteristics and how they mix and uh, some of the associated weather that comes along with them. So um, first off, I apologize. This is actually a condensed version of this information. Um, and so you'll see that the note sheet doesn't necessarily match perfectly with the presentation as I've had to change lots of things. Um, but uh, I'll go through and answer each question from the note sheet um, as we move through the presentation. And uh, if you have any questions, as always, please let me know. But it may take a little bit of a uh, little bit of research to find exactly some of the answers. But I'll show them to you here and how to do that. All right. So um, basic meteorology concepts. So we have, of course, uh, looked at wind belts. We've looked at different types of um, how to portray information through station models. Uh, you have a little bit of familiarity with this material coming from, uh, I think, sixth grade. Um, so we're going to get right into it. And we're going to start with um, the discussion of what is a Hadley cell. So, so Earth's global winds. Um, because of the tilt of Earth's axis and the rotation of the planet, there are wind belts across the earth. And so just real quickly, we have these very special uh, latitudes. We have the equator, um, 30 and 30 degrees north and south of the equator, and then 60 degrees north and south of the equator. So let's start with the incoming solar radiation. So um, most of the sun's energy is delivered around the equator, um, depending on the time of year, between 23.5 degrees north latitude or the Tropic of Cancer uh, in June, the summer solstice. And then of course the direct sunlight will move all the way down to 23.5 degrees south latitude at the Tropic of Capricorn in our winter in December. Um, and then start its progression back up. So at the equator, um, that's kind of the average. Uh, the sun hits directly there um, in the fall and the spring during those equinoxes, the sun will be directly overhead. So sun's energy just kind of moves back and forth around the equator. Because the equator is absorbing so much solar radiation, we have intense energy going into the planet, causing water vapor to heat up, or air, the atmosphere to heat up very rapidly, um, the ocean, of course, to heat up very rapidly over there um, at that latitude. And so we have this low pressure where the air is rising very rapidly. Um, as that air rises, it cools, condenses, form clouds, um, but it can't go too far. Um, it has to stop and it stops at something called the tropopause. So here at the equator, we have this low pressure, air is rising, cooling, condensing, forming huge bands of clouds, hits the top of the atmosphere and spreads out in both directions. As it spreads out, it cools and then sinks. It sinks around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. Um, so you can see in this diagram where the air is sinking here. And then it has nowhere to go except spread outwards in both directions. So it spreads out um, back towards the equator and then up to higher latitudes. So here, instead of low pressure, at 30 degrees north and south, we have high pressure. Um, the air is sinking very rapidly, pushing down and then spreading back out. And this creates a convection cell um, between 30 degrees north and south of the, and the equator and rising cooling. Uh, rising, cooling, condensing, sinking, getting reheated back up at the equator, and then rising again. Um, we have six total Hadley cells. So the first one here at the equator, due to the sun's energy hitting there, creating that low pressure. Um, the sinking air at about 30 degrees north and south, high pressure. And then at the poles, we have very cold 
air because we're not getting very much solar radiation there. So air is sinking. That makes high pressure. And of course, it goes on both sides. And of course, at the uh, bottom of the Earth, it goes up that way, um, which creates another high pressure area at both poles. Remember, high pressure equals dry, cold air. That's why at the North and South Pole, um, they're really deserts. They don't receive very much um, precipitation at all. So that air spreads out, and then when it hits about 60 degrees um, north and south latitudes, that converging air causes it to move again, up again. So we have another low pressure area at 60 degrees north and south. Altogether, we have six of these convection cells, six of these Hadley cells. All right. Now, the jet stream is due to um, these very the rotation of the planet and these very fast winds up in the higher atmosphere. So because of the rotation of the planet, um, because of this differential heating, uh, we have this ribbon of high speed winds at the very top of the troposphere. Um, remember as those Hadley cells are pushing up, they're hitting the top of the troposphere and moving out in different directions. And because of, like I said, our axial tilt and differential heating, um, it creates these jet streams. And these jet streams actually drive weather from one side of the earth to the other. Um, as you'll notice here where we are at our latitudes, we get a lot of our weather from the west. We're in the westerly. So um, these jet streams will actually bring air from the west coast all the way to us. So these winds correlate to global winds and they relate to storm movement. All right, what is the ITCZ. The ITCZ is the intertropical convergence zone, and it represents the meeting of the easterlies near the equator. But you got to remember, the Earth goes around the sun. It stays at its axial tilt, so different parts of the Earth is going to be heated at different rates. Um, so this ITCZ changes its position seasonally and is really based on geography. So let me show you a little animation. this down. All right. All right. Load, baby, load. Here we go. All right, so here we have a map of the Earth, and you see, of course, 30 degrees north and south, 60 degrees north and south. So I'm going to cut my labels on. Got everything. I'm going to show my Hadley cells. So um, let's start at March, around March 21st or so. So March 21st represents, of course, the um, spring equinox. That means at the equator, the sun's going to be directly over your head. So at that time, you'll notice that this line here, the ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone. And what that represents is that Hadley cell. So at the equator, of course, air is going to rise very rapidly, hit the top of the tropopause, cool, sink back down, and then flow back together. That's what a convergence is. Convergence just means the air is flowing together. And so you'll see all along this line here, that air from 30 degrees north and south is just meeting at the equator. But watch what happens as we move forward throughout the year. So from March, um, representing our spring equinox to June 21st, notice how the line shifted up. So now at around June 21st, the sun is directly over the Tropic of Cancer at 23.5 degrees latitude, so right about here. And notice how this line has shifted up. So what do you think is gonna happen um, when we get into our fall equinox. Hopefully you understand that it will drop. And so now the, um, because the sunlight, direct sunlight is back at the equator, you'll see that the ITCZ dropped. And then we'll continue to drop all the way to December 21st, where now the sun is directly overhead at the Tropic of Capricorn at 23.5 south. So you can see how the Hadley cell has shifted down. And then it goes, I'll go all the way back here, starts to rise again. And so this convergence zone where the Hadley cell is pushing this air together, you'll see that it follows those seasonal changes. Now, all along this area, you have air rising. 
Um, it's also a place where there's not a lot of wind. So it's actually called the doldrums. When um, uh, Europeans established trade routes uh, into the west, um, if they got near this area, the wind would die. And of course, if you're running on a ship that uses sails, dying wind is not a very good thing. And so they actually get stuck there and they're called doldrums. Um, but once they get beyond that, either north or south, then the winds will pick back up. Um, of course, the easterlies here and then the easterlies below the equator as well. All right. Next question. Um, why do low pressure areas tend to have clouds? All right. Pressure and clouds. Low pressure means rising air. If you ever look at a weather map, you'll notice that the L is always in red and the H is always in blue. So low pressure means rising air. Why does air rise? It gets warm. So when the air gets warm, it rises. As it rises, a couple of things happens. One thing, remember back to our discussion of radiation. So radiation from the sun hits the surface, heats the surface up. That surface is in direct contact with the atmosphere. Now the atmosphere is warm, air will start to rise. As it rises, two things happen. As you get further away from the surface, it gets colder. That's one thing. The second thing is the air is less dense as you move up, um, which relates back to air pressure. So as that air is rising, it's cooling. When the air hits a certain temperature based on its pressure, that allows water vapor to condense from a water vapor form to a liquid form. So please understand, a lot of people get this wrong. P please understand that clouds are liquid water. They are tiny droplets of water suspended in the atmosphere. Um, so these clouds form because that air is rising cooling, condensing, forming clouds. That's why you generally have this large band of clouds all around the equator is from that low pressure air. Once the air cools, it begins to sink. This creates high pressure. Air is cooler and it's sinking down. That's why the H is in blue. It's pushing down. So low pressure air is rising, high pressure air is sinking. Low pressure creates clouds because as that air is rising, it's cooling and condensing forming little tiny droplets that get suspended in air. High pressure means you don't have cloud formation. Typically, you have high pressure. You'll know it because it'll be clear. Um, there will be very few clouds in the sky. You'll have lots of wind, um, and it'll also be quite cooler. All right, we're going to talk more about clouds in just a few minutes, but let's talk about how winds are named. So speaking of wind, um, winds are always named based on the direction they come from. All right. If a wind is blowing from the west, it's a westerly wind. If this wind is blowing from the south, it's a southerly wind, from the north, northerly. We always name wind based on the direction that it's blowing from. All right. Moving on. Rising, sinking, and pressure. Um, so the question in the notes, number six, is what regional pressures exist? So we know based on our Hadley cells, based on global wind belts, we know that we have low pressure, general low pressure areas at the equator and at 60 degrees north. We know that in general, regional pressures, we have high pressure at 30 degrees, where air is sinking, and then also at 90 degrees at the north and south pole, air is sinking. So these low pressure areas are going to tend to have a lot more cloud formation, which leads to more precipitation. Um, your tropical rainforests a lot of times are found near the equator, um, more specifically around the um, ITCZ, the Interior Tropical Convergence Zone. And then a lot of your deserts are actually found at around 30 degrees and 90 degrees, of course, but 30 degrees um, because air is sinking. It's very dry, very dry. All right, so continuing on, how are these different from daily weather? Well, daily weather is really dependent on the local properties of the air. So let me talk a little bit about cloud formation. Um, have you ever been outside and it's kind of warm, the air is kind of humid or sticky feeling? 
got lots of clouds in the sky, and then a storm develops, starts to rain. Rain comes down, and then after the rain passes, it's cooler, and there's hardly any clouds in the sky, nice blue sky. So what's happening is air, when it rises, it cools, condenses, and forms clouds. That's low pressure. The air is rising, cooling, condenses, forms those clouds. Once those clouds get heavy enough, we get, of course, precipitation. In a situation like I was talking about, you got a mountain of cold air that's pushing across. So if you're standing stationary, you'll get this warm, sticky feeling. Then all of a sudden, you'll have this rain, and then it'll be cold and high pressure, clear skies right behind it. Um, so that is that mountain of cold air that's pushing towards you, acting like a wedge, pushing that warm air up um, so that it cools, condenses, and forms clouds. So got a real quick demonstration for you if you've never seen this. All right. Got a little bottle, just a plastic bottle, just a orange juice bottle. Um, inside the bottle, I have some water. All right. High pressure. Just squeeze in the bottle. High pressure. High pressure means no cloud formation. Low pressure, when air is rising, it cools, depressurizes, and allows the water to condense. So when I let go, wait a minute, I'm missing something. The term is called condensation nuclei. Water vapor has to condense onto something. So there are tiny particles in the atmosphere. You're breathing them all the time. Things like ash um, from fires or volcanoes, uh, little tiny particles, dust, um, pollen grains, salt, anything. So we need to do a little something to make this work a little effectively. Sorry if it doesn't 100% show on the screen, but like I said, you can look up tons of these. Sorry, Got a match. We need condensation nuclei to make our cloud look. So I'm um, going to take this, strike it, hopefully. Just going to let it burn for a second. Get some of that smoke on the inside of there. We need condensation nuclei. Close it up. All right. High pressure. Air is sinking. Low pressure, air is rising, cooling, condensing. Let's see. And then your cloud will form. So, sorry, it's not very clear, but a little bit of cloud forming in the bottom. Shake it up a little bit. High pressure, low pressure. So, a little bit of cloud formation. Sorry, it's not very clear on that. Please look that up on a YouTube video. It'll be a lot more um, dramatic. And of course, it works in the classroom as well. Again, low pressure, air is rising. As it rises, it cools and condenses around some kind of condensation nuclei. High pressure, air is sinking, no cloud formation. All right. Next one. How does wind move? There's a couple of things I need for you to remember here. First off, um, wind always moves from high pressure to low pressure. So where that air is sinking, it has to go somewhere. And so where it goes, of course, is straight down to the ground, but it can't go into the ground, so it moves out and away. It moves into areas of low pressure. So if you're sitting in an area of low pressure, the wind will always move from somewhere else, from high pressure area, and push towards you. So that's the first thing. Um, wind always moves from high pressure to low pressure. Pretty simple. Now, I'm going to draw your attention to this little diagram, and I'll show you another one as well, this one. So we have high pressure, low pressure. Notice that the wind is moving from the high into the low. Um, low pressure means air is rising, so something has to fill in that empty space. And so areas of high pressure flow to areas of low pressure. Notice these circles here, and these circles have these numbers, 1028, 1024, 1020. And over here we have 1016 and 1012. Those are representing barometric pressure in millibars. Millibars is just a measurement of air pressure, um, and it actually comes from, uh, the term millibar actually is from the instrument that measures barometric pressure, um, and it looked at 
inches of mercury, and I think that was equated eventually into something called millibars. So um, wind will always move from high pressure to low pressure, but notice the direction. So in high pressure, you'll notice that there's a clockwise rotation. Now remember, no cloud formation here because air is sinking. Notice it has a clockwise formation. Over here on the low pressure, notice it has a counterclockwise formation. So around this way. So not only will air or wind move from high to low pressure, but in high pressure, it moves clockwise. In low pressure, it moves counterclockwise. These circles that are representing barometric pressure, these are very similar to topographic maps. These are called isobars um, instead of isolines or isocontours. Isobars, um, let's say this was an actual map. An isobar is just connecting areas of equal barometric air pressure. What that it does, when you put that on a map, it allows you to see the actual air masses. Air is invisible, so how do we see it? Well, we see it based on its temperature and its pressure. Um, you could also use humidity as well, but the pressure will tell you how the wind will move. Um, so these circles represent areas of the same or equal pressure, and notice how they get higher as you move in towards the center for high pressure, and then for low pressure, they get lower as you move in. So isobars are just areas of equal pressure, and I think that answers number nine. So number 10, how are they um, topographic maps similar or different? They're still measuring the same kind of thing. They're taking equal points or equal values and connecting them. So in a topographic map, you're looking at topography or mountain formations, depressions, things like that. Um, but when we talk about weather, we need to see high and low pressure. So we map out areas of equal pressure. So in this slide, you'll see that's what is happening here. Now that you have some familiarity with uh, synoptic weather models, take a look at this wind. See how the first one here is moving uh, from the, sorry, northwest, from the west, southwest, then over here, southeast. And then if I move over again, over here, got from the west, the west, southwest, and over here, southeast. Can you see the rotation? What kind of rotation do you see? This is going counterclockwise. So because it's going counterclockwise, I know it has low pressure. If we look at the barometric pressure, here we have 976.4, 984.7, 984.8, 81.9, and over here, higher pressure, um, and notice that it's also clear, uh, 1,008.7, 997.8. So we have this area of low pressure here that winds are moving counterclockwise. And if we were to map this out with uh, isobars, you would see that we have this low pressure target in the middle and then gets higher as it moves out. So based on how wind moves, we're able to better predict what kind of wind we're going to have, but also because wind drives weather, what kind of weather we could have. All right, so um, on your notes, I have this thing to help you remember high and low pressure and how wind moves. All right, so everybody stick out your right thumb. The thumb is representing the direction of air movement. So here we have that thumb pointing up. This is your right thumb. It has to be right low pressure because air is rising. So as the air is rising, it's cooling, condensing, forming clouds. If you look at your fingers, notice how they move counterclockwise. They're wrapping counterclockwise. So at low pressure, air is rising counterclockwise. And then of course the opposite would be true. High pressure, air is sinking clockwise. All right. So Air around low pressure moving up and counterclockwise. Air around high pressure down and clockwise. How do you think that would operate in the southern hemisphere? Well, it's backwards. It's, well, I say backwards, it's just opposite. So in the southern hemisphere, because of the rotation of the earth and the Coriolis effect, things are flipped. Um, high pressure will still sink, but it'll move. Um, counterclockwise, low pressure still rises, but will move clockwise. Um, this is why 
hurricanes move counterclockwise because they're areas of huge low pressure, huge, huge, huge low pressure. And so it moves counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. And then in the southern hemisphere, the same type of cyclonic activity, um, they, they may call them typhoons. It really just depends on the location. Um, but in the southern hemisphere, they will move clockwise. All right. So, but for us, please remember low pressure, air is rising counterclockwise. Air always moves from high pressure into low. All right. So, let's talk about some tools of the trade. Um, there are three major tools that we need in order to help interpret the weather. Um, and there's more as well. These are just three of the main ones, three major elements. Um, but of course, there's also the anemometer, which measures wind speed and a weather vane or wind vane that measures wind direction. Um, and there's lots of other instruments, but these are the three main ones that I really want you to be familiar with. Temperature, as measured by a thermometer. Air pressure. Um, measured by um, I'll put, uh, air pressure. Sorry, is that a brain fart? Um, and humidity measured by a uh, psychrometer or um, hygrometer. Oh, sorry, air pressure barometer, barometer, B A R, like bar, um, millibars, barometer. There we go. So, temperature is pretty easy. Um, measures the thermometer, measures the kinetic energy of um, air molecules. Barometer measures air pressure, and how it does that is there's a tiny little cylinder in there that responds very sensitively to changes in air pressure. So as air is um, air pressure rises, there's more air pushing down. The weight of the air is higher. It pushes down on that little cylinder and causes the the needle to rise. If you ever get a chance to look at a barometer, you'll notice that not only is there low pressure to high pressure, and it'll say like low to medium high, it'll also have stormy, um, cloudy, fair weather. Because remember, high pressure, air is sinking, cloudless day, a little bit breezy, a little bit cool. Um, high pressure equates to nice, fair weather, whereas low pressure relates to stormy weather. So. Air pressure measured with a barometer, looking at the weight of the air. Humidity. Now, humidity is a tricky one. There's two ways to measure it. And on your synoptic plots, you're going to be um, looking at both. But both give lots of value. So we start with absolute humidity. It's the measure of the actual amount of water vapor in the air, regardless of temperature. It's measured in grams per meters cubed. Um, absolute humidity looks at the actual amount of water vapor in the air. So if that's a really high number, it's going to be very humid feeling. Um, very low number is going to be very dry feeling. But then we also have something called relative humidity. So based on the temperature and pressure of the air, it determines how much water vapor the air can hold. So relative humidity is the amount of water vapor in the air expressed as a percentage of the maximum amount that it can hold. Warm air can hold a lot of water vapor. That's why summertime, late at night, it's sticky feeling. Warm air holds a lot of water vapor. Cold air cannot hold very much water vapor. What's the driest place in your house? It's actually the freezer. The air is so cold there. Inside of your freezer, it cannot hold water vapor. Um, so relative humidity looks at how much water vapor is in the air versus how much could it hold. When that number is 100%, that means the air is saturated with water vapor and it's probably raining or snowing or something. Um, when your relative humidity is very low, that means that the air could hold a lot more water vapor, but isn't. Um, and it typically means very dry conditions. So if you look at the little diagram here, you'll notice that both of these have the same actual amount of water vapor. The difference is because the air is colder, it can't hold as much total, and so it will have a high humidity number here. Whereas here, it could hold a lot more water vapor, but it's not there. And so you actually have a lower humidity, lower relative humidity over here. But relative humidity is the amount of water vapor in the air um, compared to the amount that it could hold. So it's expressed as a percentage.
This is called a psychrometer. And I just wanna to touch base with you on this. A psychrometer actually uses two different thermometers. So um, a psychrometer measures relative humidity. And if we were in class, we'd actually be doing this, but um, there's two thermometers here. And so what you do is you actually take it outside and you spin it around a bunch of times. One bulb measures just the actual air temperature. No problem there. The other bulb is a wet bulb. The wet bulb has a piece of cloth or some kind of material that's wet. So it's been dipped in water, um, squeeze out a little bit of it, but you just wrap it around. When you take this thing and you twirl it through the air, the temperature bulb, the dry bulb, just picks up the actual air temperature. The wet bulb, the water will evaporate off of that bulb and cause that bulb's temperature reading to drop. If the air is very, very dry, there's a lot of evaporation that happens off that wet one. And so lots of evaporation, that temperature on that bulb drops dramatically. And so then you just look at the two temperatures, divide them out, and you have your percent relative humidity. However, if the air is very, very moist, and you spin that thing around, if that temperature doesn't change very much at all on the wet bulb, that means that the air is super saturated with um, water vapor. And so your relative humidity is going to be very, very high. Anyway, it's called a sling psychrometer. Um, and it really looks at uh, how relative humidity is measured based on temperature, based on how hot or cold it is. Because remember, hot air holds a lot more water vapor. Cold air holds a lot less. All right. Dew point. So this is another thing that you're going to record on your synoptic plot. Dew point is the temperature at which water vapor will condense. So you ever see a cloud and it's flat on the bottom? All right. There's a point in the atmosphere. And it just really depends on the temperature and the pressure. But the dew point is the temperature at which water vapor will condense. So why clouds have flat bottoms is because that air finally reached that dew point, that point where water can go from a gas to a liquid. Um, and again, it's based on pressure. You start playing with pressure, you really start playing with um, the boiling point, melting point, or whatever. Um, but in terms of weather, the dew point is the temperature at which water will condense. So for example, um, at night, sun goes down, let's say your air temperature is 75 degrees, but your dew point is 62. So that means that in the air, it'll feel kind of humid, but on the leaf that cooled off very quickly and drops below that dew point of 62 degrees, the leaf gets to 60, water will start to condense on it. Um, this is why things develop dew at night. So the air temperature will be kind of warm compared to the dew point, but the, the objects on the ground cooled below that dew point. And so um, the water vapor will actually condense on it. But that's why clouds have a flat bottom. It reaches that dew point, that critical temperature at which water will condense. And so it'll have a nice flat bottom. All right. So how do we make a cloud? Um, as we just said, when air rises, it cools. It also depressurizes. And so the water vapor will condense around some kind of condensation nuclei to form that cloud. Um, we're going to look at combinations of words to make different types of clouds in just a second. But let me just speak to this little diagram. Let's say we have a mountain and we have uh, prevailing westerly winds. So Clouds will be pushed against that mountain because they can't go through it, they have to go above it. So as the air rises up, it cools, condenses, form a cloud, it could rain, causing the rain to fall right back down on the same side. On the other side, you have this cold, dry, sinking air. So what we often find is something called a rain shadow effect, and this is very common out west. So as air from off the Pacific Ocean, very moist, moves up and tries to go up over the uh, the Rocky Mountains. It cools, condenses, forming clouds and rain. It comes right back down, keeping everything on the western side very moist, very wet. But on the other side, desert conditions. So again, to make a cloud, clouds are liquid droplets of water. It's when air rises, cools, condenses, hits that dew point, condenses around some kind of condensation nuclei, forms a cloud. So the question is, what kinds of um, different combinations make different types of clouds. So let me show you 
for you Latin people, you'll enjoy this. This appendix that I found, I just typed in clouds Latin. So um, when you looked at your synoptic plots, you know that clouds can form at low levels, mid levels and high levels. So let's start with that. Um, low level clouds typically refer to stratus clouds, stratus, um, which means to extend or to spread out or flatten out. Your mid-level clouds are your alto clouds, and that means um, from the Latin altum, which means height or upper air. So this is your mid-level clouds, clouds. And then you have your cirrus clouds. Cirrus means lock of hair, wispy. Those are your very high-level clouds, typically made of ice crystals. All right, some of the other words that you'll see is something called cumulus, which means a heap or a pile. Um, and then you'll also see nimbo, which means rainy clouds. So we can put these words together to help describe all of these different cloud types that you saw in the chart for synoptic weather. Things like cumulonimbus, heap of rain, basically. Um, Zoom in a little bit on this. Um, cirrus clouds, like I said, which are your highest clouds, and typically made of ice crystal ice crystals, and they look very wispy. Um, alto cumulus, mid-level heap. And then, of course, you have some kind of strange-looking clouds, like tornadoes, mamatis clouds, um, lenticulars, and things like that. But, like I said, the um, the Latin translations for those words can really help describe those clouds. Now, of course, clouds lead to weather, but the biggest thing is clouds are very important predictors of weather. So, for example, if you see serious cirrus clouds, you'll typically find that the weather is going to change pretty soon. It usually means a cold front is getting ready to move in. If you see cumulonimbus clouds, of course, you should expect rain, showers, thunderstorms even. Um, and then other types of clouds can lead to different things like snow and other things. But clouds are really big predictors of weather. All right, the last little bit here, synoptic meteorology. So there's some uh, questions for you and the notes um, just to help review synoptic meteorology. I will say that um, for this class, you're not expected to know absolutely everything and to be able to, pr to produce these huge elaborate synoptic plots of current weather. But there are a few things that I really want you to know and understand such as the temperature, 77 degrees, humidity, 71%. It uses rel relative humidity or dew point, sorry, dew point. Um, current weather, like this one I think is rain showers, and then air pressure right here. The air pressure is the hardest one. Um, you just have to make it make sense. I can't put a 10 in front of this number. That would be too big. I have to put a nine there, so 999.8. And then the last one, of course, is the wind speed and direction. So the line here looks at which direction the wind is blowing from. We always talk about wind from where it's blowing from. And then the two lines over here denote wind speed. So if it's a small line, it's five miles per hour, big lines are 10. So in this case, we have temperature of 77 degrees, it's rainy, um, air pressure is 999.8 millibars. We have wind blowing from the southwest at 20 miles per hour and a dew point of 71 degrees. All right, there's lots of other examples in here, but I'm not expecting you to go through absolutely all of them. If you can fill out those main things like this one, we're good to go. I just need to be able, need you to be able to look at a map and be able to interpret, especially the wind and the air pressure um, to be able to help predict the weather. All right, so again, you'll see uh, in the notes some little, um, little practice problems, basically. All right, and I think that will cover it for this part of the presentation. Um, the next part of the notes is actually a reading, a uh, textbook reading, so please just go through the reading um, and answer, be able to answer those questions. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions about this material or anything on the specifics, please let me know. Um, take care, see you soon.